Sheldon is an award-winning fly tire, past president ah. of the Isaac Walton Fly Fishing Club, inductee in the Canadian Fly Fishing Museum, and an avid fly angler. He was the flying, uh, fly tying co-editor of the Canadian Fly Fisher magazine and a guide with the Grand Co-op, Grand Guides Co-op. Well, now he's retired and he's agreed to teach us a thing or two about tying with snowshoe rabbit. There well, everyone I think is um, familiar with a fly that a guy named Fran Betters created called the Usual. And the Usual is an interesting little pattern. If you've ever seen Fran tie one of these things, it is the most ugly looking wretched mess you've ever seen, but it still has a way of catching fish. A lot of people also don't know that the usual was originally called the Phillips usual. A fellow by the name of Bill Phillips, who was a member of the Isaac Walton Fly Fishing Club, is the person who sort of brought the fly around and promoted it to people. So it's, um, it's been around since, oh, probably the early 80s, maybe even in the late 70s. It all, it all began when Fran Betters was given a couple of snowshoe rabbit feet. That's what these things are. Um, and he decided to tie his haystack with them. Uh, he would tie those haystacks with deer hair, and he'd also tie them with woodchuck. All of those patterns worked very, very well. Great thing. But like anything else, um, there are some subtleties involved in using snowshoe. If you want to bend it a little bit to something perhaps a little more imitative rather than the suggestive pattern that the usual was originally. So let's talk first about snowshoes, rabbits, varying hairs, and uh, the sources of materials that you can get. But contrary to popular opinion, any rabbit, any type of rabbit or hair can be used to tie these flies. Um, the advantage of snowshoe is that the hair is the longest that I've been able to find. So you have the most flexibility with flies, especially larger ones that you want to tie. But you can use here, for example, as a comparison, I hope you can see that. But what I have in this hand is a snowshoe foot. And what I have in this hand is a hair. This is a, a European hair. They, they were released in this area some years ago. And uh, they're growing, they're all over the place now. Ideally, you want to try and get these feet during the winter time. Um, this is when the hair is at its best. Now, not all snowshoe rabbit feet are the same, not surprisingly. Um, let me delve through here. Yes, here we go. Someone sent me a few of these. You can see right away the difference in size between these two feet. Um, so the rabbits, the, the animals themselves come in various sizes. Uh, but what's key to it is there are three sections to a snowshoe rabbit foot that are important. I'm gonna try and hold it up here where you can see it. This section to the front, the toes. The toes are very even in, their, in the fur, um, in, in the hair. So you wanna use the section with toes whenever you need a little bit of precision, like in wings, that kind of thing. The instep is the middle part. The middle part has the longest hair. And you use this for much larger, fly, the largest flies you're going to tie, but also for any time you want to fold or wrap the uh, hair. And lastly, in the heel section here, this is ideal for small flies and for tails, tailing material on the usual. That's where I do that kind of work from there. The key to it is, as you can see, on, maybe you can see it on this one. I trim the, the side hair off so I can get into the real qual quality of the, the fur inside, the hair inside. As you can see from this, I've cut out some of the toes. Not uncommon to take the toes and get your fingers in there and break them apart so you can get into the material. Don't be afraid about that. You're, the animal's dead, it doesn't care anymore. <laughs> There. That way you can separate them and you can take out the pieces. So you see this section here, nice and even and whatnot. And it makes great wings for things like the usual and for things like um, 
spent spinners, those kinds of things. It make, makes great posts as well for um, parachute hackles. Um, you can get them in a wide range of colors. I'll show you some of my favorites here. Natural, of course. Um, black. Olive. Yellow. And then after that, things sort of get silly. Here we have claret. And here we have bright orange and chartreuse. And if anyone sees rabbits hopping around in this color, check yourself into a hospital. Purple. I have not tied with these yet, but I'm going to get to it at some point. But I generally like to use different pat colors on different patterns. So um, there really is not much more I can tell you about this. Oh, just as a side, does anyone know the difference between rabbit and hare? They're different animals. And the, their difference primarily comes from the way they come into the world. Rabbits come in like kittens and, and puppies do, with their eyes closed and helpless. But hares come into the world as miniature versions of the adult. And within an hour or so, those things are ready to run for their life. I guess it all has to do with the kind of predation they are faced with. Um, I'm going to tie, I sent out a series of them. I'm going to try and follow this list as best I can. Um, I'm going to tie starting with the usual. And I'm going to show you how I tie it perhaps a little differently than Fran did. Um, so I'm going to set a hook in the vise here. I'm going to be using light colored material. So I'm wearing a shirt that I hope will contrast well with, um, with what you see. If anyone has any trouble, let me know. So I'm going to switch cameras here. And the next camera you should see, there I am. Body by Sarah Lee. <laughs> I'm going to use a size 12 hook here. Um, usuals can be tied. Typically, they will go from size 18 to size 10, something along those lines. I'm going to use. Hopefully you'll be able to see this thread without too much difficulty. Yeah, let's try the uh, orange. Well, that's a little better maybe. So, get rid of these, these just get in the way. Start your thread as usual, <laughs> no pun intended. Let me find a, A working foot here. Oh, there's one. Okay, as I mentioned before, if you're going to do the wing, you want to choose the area from the toes. What I do is I separate out the material I want, I get my scissors down in there nice and low, cut out a section, take a moment. Clean out the, the material in the in the base like that. Pull it all out like this. Now the secret to tying this stuff in is you never tie in with the nice finished material here. You always want to tie in by the soft part at the base. It does a couple of things. It leaves all the good material where you can use it, but more importantly, it cuts down on bulk. So we just measure that up, position it between one quarter and one third of the way back. There's no real concern here, one way or the other. A couple of good tight turns. Cut this off at a bit of an angle. And then just catch it all up like that. Now I like to stand my up right away. Bring your thread in front. And this takes a lot of wraps. Essentially, if you want that wing to stay up, 
the thread wraps in front must be equal to the height of the thread wraps behind the wing. So what I will do is I'll build up a ramp and when it gets starts to get silly, I will come under it at an angle like this to help build up in the front. And then take your wing and form it out. You want it to form a half circle kind of effect. Like that. Bring your thread behind. And stop at the point where you tied down the wing. Now you're going to take a little bit from the heel with a half twist there, trim it out. Again, spend a little time pulling the material out like that. The original the original pattern, they actually used the material I pulled out to um, dub the fly. But we don't do that very much anymore. Now, measure it up. And what you want to do is you want to cut this at an angle. That angle should come close to matching the slope that you created when you tied in your wing. Your first turn should be right in the middle and then wrap forward securing the tail down and then wrap back to define the length of the body. Everybody see that all right? And when that is done, all you do now is dub the entire body. You don't um, do it all in one go here. Now, slide it into place. And just wrap the entire thing all the way forward. Make sure you get the underside by the base of the wing nice and clean. And that's all there is to it. That's your basic usual. Quick whip finish. And your fly is ready to go. So this is what I call the dozen an hour or more patterns. You can tie these up real quickly. So the dubbing was just some uh, fur cut from the middle section? No, I actually am using, um, this believe it or not is ginger cat, brushed out. But you can use rabbit dubbing. The original pattern, they actually took the stuff that they were d dragging out of the and, and actually dubbed with that. But uh, when you do that, it becomes very, very bulky. So what you're trying to do here now, you see you end up with a reasonably, I don't know, can you see, a reasonably thin body on this, um, which is what you're trying to, well, which, which is what I'm trying to achieve when I tie usuals. Now, with the various colors you've got, you can do a lot of different things. You can, for instance, change the tail and use something like a little bit of crystal flash or this MOP stuff here, mother of whatever the heck it is, as a sort of like a shuck on the tail. And we call that the sparkle as usual. Um, you can tie a very good imitation of a green drake with this. You use the olive for the wing, uh, and that works very, very well. You can use, there's a, there's a pattern we call Dan's usual, tied on a size 16 uh, with a black body. And it's one of those 
can imitate an ant, it can imitate a beetle, it can imitate a lot of things, but with the, the natural wing material, the natural color, it's still quite visible on the water. It makes it it's a great pattern for evenings and early mornings. Um, you can, you know, just about do anything. Um, um, one of the colors that I did not mention, and I can't put my finger on, no, oh, here's part of one, is um, dun, gray duns. Um, they have, a, they're very useful colors. I try to keep them in, I can tell by the looks of my feet here, I'm gonna to have to get some more. Um, but it's a great pattern. Oh, here's one that's almost complete. This is um, a blue dun type pattern. You use this for, you know, Hendrick Finns here in the east, but any kind of a fly that has a fairly dark uh, wing, it works for, very well with. Um, and you can just use any bright color, if you will, for the wing, so that you can just see the fly from across the water. My eyes aren't what they used to be. In fact, they're not even <laughs> they're getting worse by the day. Um, so that is essentially how the usual works. It's a very, very simple pattern. And as I say, you can tie this in a lots of lots of different ways. There's an error on there. It says from the hair, foot hair from the toes. It shouldn't be. It should be from, oh, sorry, from the toes. That's right, not from the heel. Okay, so it is right. Ah, good for you, Sheldon. Got it right for a change. Sheldon, now, Sheldon, yes, sir. I have a question about the thread color. When, yep. I, when I first learned to tie these, uh, the book I got it from made a point of saying that what you wanted was a red thread so that the, that it would show through when with the dubbing sort of sparse. Yep. Is that is that uh... I tie I tie it with orange or with red. Okay. <clears throat> I was thinking that the orange might show up a little better here in, on the uh, in fact um, Fran better is often tied with a, a with a with a bright orange like a fluorescent orange or a fire orange. And the idea is <clears throat> that um, the color would bleed through when it was on the water and it would indicate that the fly is gravid, that it's full of eggs. And the theory is, is that the fish will discern, they will take, they'll take an egg, uh, a fly that has eggs in it before it will take another one. Uh, I don't know how true that is. Uh, fish aren't telling us, but there's a lot of people there who'd like to believe it. Good, okay? thank you. That answers my question, yes. Yeah, uh, I, in, when I'm trying to tie to a specific species, like if I'm trying to do a, a green drake or something like that, I will often not use these bright colors, but I'll use something that matches. So it just, it just depends. Okay, okay. thanks. Now. Sheldon? Yes, sir. Uh, tying with rabbit, is there an advantage? Like, does it float better or do you still have hmm. to use... Uh, floating on it or is there any advantage that way okay uh good question should have mentioned it earlier as a matter of fact um snowshoe rabbit foot has all of the advantages of cdc plus the fact that it doesn't mat up and 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 um you know every time you catch a fish on one of those cdc flies you either have to change the fly or you got to spend half an hour drying it in something right they put in little shakers and I see the guys on the screens, they're shaking the hell out of it and the fish are rising all around them. This stuff is virtually indestructible. I have literally tied on a fly at the beginning of the day, caught as many fish as anybody else and cut the same fly off at the end of the day. When it does seem to like it's dragging a little bit, you, you put floatant on it, but more often what I do is I just dop it off on my shirt and throw it back in the water. It's, uh, it's, it's that kind of stuff. You can use this material anywhere it calls for CDC and in a lot of places where it calls for deer hair and elk hair, especially in the smaller sizes. And in fact, what I'm going to tie next is a caddis, which you would normally use deer hair or elk hair for, but instead I'm going to show you to tie it in with snowshoe. Virtually indestructible. The, the hair on caddis like that tends to break off because it's quite brittle. This will never do that. Very, very useful that way. Thank you. All right. And that's exactly what we're going to do next. A caddis. Um, as far as I know, I hate to take 
claim for things, but as far as I know, I'm the first person who started doing using snowshoe for caddis, but I could be wrong. Um, exactly the same, uh, you know, I mean, this is, this will be a little bit repetitive. You're not going to learn any fancy new techniques here, I don't think. Start back about a third of the way on the hook. And I like to lay down. I don't like to spend a lot of time wrapping excess thread if I don't need it. Um, when I was guiding, you know, usually it'd be like one o'clock in the morning and I've got to tie a dozen flies to meet a client in the morning and I got to be there at 5.30. So <clears throat> my flies started to get much simpler. But uh, that didn't mean they didn't catch fish. Okay, so the, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna double a little bit of a body. I'm gonna just use some of the same, the same um, <clears throat> fur that I was using before. That's probably too much. I'm just gonna put a little bit of a body on here. Now, if you wanted to do this in the Al Troth style, you could of course, tie in a hackle here so that you can hackle the body. Uh, Leonard Wright had a style where he put the hackle on the front. That was mostly out here in the east. And I know the, um, the trough style is much, it's very popular out west. And both will work for, for this particular. Yeah, Sheldon, you ever done this before? Yeah, once or twice, but not tonight. Okay, just any little bit of a body and I'll put a little bit more thread down here to hold the next step, which is the wing. And for that, I've got to find my, here, this one. And again, I want a nice even wing, so I'm gonna take it from the toes. And I'm going to tie this as a downwing. One of the little tricks that sometimes you can use is you can take a turn of thread just around the hair and then around the hook, and tighten up on it. And that'll help keep it up on top of the hook. I'd like to say it helps stop spinning, but that takes a little more doing. There we go. So there we have a downwing. And I'm not above taking my scissors and adjusting the shape of the wing if I'm not happy with it, but I'm happy with this wing. And then all I'm going to do now is, is I'm just going to grab, <clears throat> this is um, barred ginger. Find myself a hackle here and just put a few turns on the front. Go further down. You don't want it to be too long. That'll work. You can, if you wish, put a little more dubbing on top of the thread now, if, uh, if, if you wanna try and hide it. Um, I don't generally do it. I just, mainly because I really haven't found that it makes that much difference in the success of the fly. Half a dozen turns of that. It's plenty. A little trim and again just tie it off quickly now I'm 
there we go. Again, you can adjust this. Uh, can you see that there? I think it's pretty good. Right now, again, lots of variations on this. You can you can tie it. Uh, you can get a one of these feet maybe bleached a little bit lighter. You can make like a a very light caddis on it. Leaving it this way, it makes a great skittering caddis. We get these traveling sedges here on the ponds and lakes in Ontario, and I, I'm sure you must get them out west too. And this fly on the water, you just have to make sure you change the three X tippet or something. And just drag it right across the surface of the water as quickly as you can and just watch the fish come up and smash the heck out of it it's great fun but you often lose the first couple <laughs> just breaking it off on the hook set sheldon, um, sheldon can you rotate it so that we can see the underside of course nice okay um tied small okay so this is the sort of the river pattern. Uh, I might tie it a little differently if it was only going to be on, on still water. Probably wouldn't use the hackle, and I would just tie the whole fly a little bit more forward on the hook. Wouldn't change the proportions, just tie it a little more forward. Um, if I want to use this on a river now, I will often cut the hackle on the bottom, just take a, a V out of it. So I want it to sit lower on the water. It works really, really well. Um, in black, size 16 and 18, for those little black caddis. Uh, we get them here again in southern Ontario, and you can't see anything happening on the water. You cannot detect these things. They sit right on the surface, and they will actually drift downstream for as much as a kilometer or more from where they emerge. And the fish can see them from below, and they'll suck them up there, and you're going, what are these fish taking? It especially happens here in June. And uh, it's these little black caddis, size 16. We were on a trip to the, to the Adirondacks, um, uh, west branch of the Asabo River in upstate New York. And uh, I think I went through, in one weekend, I think I went through six black feet, just tying flies for everybody, because it was the only thing that was working. It was a tremendous, tremendously great success, and I've been using it ever since. Another friend of mine will do something really silly with this. He'll use pink for the wing or orange or something because he can see it easier. And it seems, he seems to catch as many fish as anybody else. So this is a, a good searching pattern. Um, it holds up quite well in current and riffles and things. So you can fish it down in the rivers. You can skitter it. Uh, it's an extremely useful fly. And then if all else fails, you can pull it under and swing it like a wet fly. It works just as well really versatile pattern. I, I tell people that if you do this, especially the usual and with this, you can get three presentations or more out of a single cast. And I don't know about you, but I, um, I got shoulders that don't seem to hold up as well as I used to. So the more I can get out of a single cast, I'll dead drift it upstream, um, you know, swing it a little, drag it a little on the surface, um, skitter it upstream a little bit afterwards, or pull it under and swing it as a wet fly. And you, you can catch a fish at almost any one of those instances. The more, the more you can get out of each cast, the better, the higher your chances of catching something. Okay. Sheldon, where do you source your, uh, your rabbit from? Um, is, it, is it important that it says snowshoe on it? Um, yeah, good question. Um, I, I haven't sourced any for a while. The last time I ordered 800 on a bulk purchase was from Newfoundland, but that was some years ago. Um, you can buy them. Most of the store, uh, the fly shops here in the east, at least, uh, and in and northeast in the United States, will have snowshoe rabbit. And you can be pretty reasonably assured that that's what you're getting is snowshoe. Um, but any, as I say, any rabbit, you know, anyone who hunts, I know you've got some really nice big hares out there in the east, in the west. 
I've seen them on, in the middle of town and whatnot. If anyone hunts those things, uh, they're throwing away those feet. You can use those feet. They're exactly the same as the hare's ears, uh, the, um, the snowshoes. Uh, further north, uh, I don't know how far north you guys get, uh, but, you know, there are there probably are snowshoe or varying hares of some sort. The Arctic hare is certainly one of those. Um, and, and these varying hares are uh, circumpolar. They, they are found all the way around uh, the northern hemisphere on all the land masses. They're found in the north of Ireland, in Scotland, in Scandinavia, and all the way across the, um, the Russian steppes, uh, right to Kamchatka. They're found in Alaska and all the way across Canada and down into the U.S. in the areas like the, uh, the Rockies and, um, and the Appalachians. So you really challenge is just to try and find someone who's got them for you. Okay, thanks. Now, most fly shops are out these days of snowshoe hair. In the mm -hmm. city, we have two kinds of hairs here in Edmonton. There is one that we call a jackrabbit, which is yes. really a hair. And we do have snowshoe hares in the river valley. Ah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think you're allowed to shoot them ah. in the city limits. Yeah, ah, so yeah. Uh, that, that'd be a little challenge, I'm afraid. Well, you can snare them. Just oh, I don't sure know you... about snaring. I Just make sure you don't get your neighbor's cat. Yeah, well, the, 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 the jackrabbits, so-called, um, they're, they're quite common in the neighborhoods, you yeah. know. You'd, You'd wake up in the morning and you'd find one in your um, in the front of the house in a yeah. little depression in the snow and stuff like that. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, another thing that's that's unique about the rabbits here in North America, uh, the eastern cottontail rabbit, which is what we find out here everywhere, is the only rabbit species that doesn't dig a burrow or a warren. Uh, all other rabbit species everywhere in the world dig these massive tunnels and warrens. Uh, you know, if you ever watched uh, or ever read Watership Downs, you know what a warren is. Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Australia has so much trouble with its rabbits. It's because they came from England. <laughs> okay. Now, so far we've concentrated on a downwing and a, and a wing that's a haystack that looks like a half moon. But the reality is um, snowshoe, um, mayflies don't have wings that, that stick out to the left and right like that. They have a single wing down the back. So one of the flies that I sort of developed was one I call a wedge wing. It's, it's, it's a little different. Let me see if I can remember how I tie it here properly. Again, I'm using this orange thread. And it's kind of a cross between the, well, it's actually more a derivative of the, of the, um, of the caddis more than anything else, because except that I add a tail, where a tail we'll just use, we'll just take some, some grizzly or something here and just, When I tie on a tail on these flies, what I'll do is I'll run my thread under the tail a couple of times and then put some tension across the top and it'll splay that just a little. You can see that on there. Yeah, the, 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 the device is in the way. And that uh, just gives it a little bit of support on the water. All right, now clean that up a little bit here. We'll, now we'll dub a bit of a bit of a body. So this is the tedious part, the repetitive part. 
Now, when I'm making this body, I want it to be I want it to sort of end abruptly, almost in a bump. Probably could use a little more, but anyway, that'll work. And now I'm gonna take, I'm going to use some of the hair now from the instep part of it. I'm not so concerned about how smoothly this goes in, but I have to shape it. And that requires Okay, so there you can see the, the clump that I have. And what I want to do is I want to tie that in so it's stacked on top and forms a single narrow wing over the back. It takes, this takes a little doing. This is not as straightforward as some other things. So I'm going to hold it like this. I'm going to take my thread and just come at a kind of an angle. Tuck it back against the body. I'll trim that out. Now I'm going to move the vise here for a bit, just so I can show you. Can you see, I hopefully you can see that that is just a narrow wing up there, you see? So not at all like the haystack at all. And if not, I, you know, I'm, not averse to taking my scissors and just going and making it a little bit more distinct. All right, then I'm gonna tie down here at the front. And again, I'm just going to put one little hackle on the front here. This pattern, I was a day on the, on the Grand River here, um, found a nice fish rising, put my usual over it, figuring this is a maid. Wouldn't take the usual after a few, turn, a few tries. So I switched to you know, a traditional hackled dry fly, wouldn't take that put this on and ate it right away. And I found that to repeat several times over the course of fishing. This just has the right, the right profile. And the fish seem to like it. Just clean this up a bit. If you find the wing is, now when you put your, your floatant in here, you will use it to help form the wing, give it that, that nice form that you want out of it. And again, just a quick whip finish. And there you go. Again, with this pattern, you can tie it to imitate the um, particular
insects of your area and by just changing the colors, you know, using the wing color or the body color, changing the thread, uh, changing the size, all of that, and it will work just fine. Let me put that on a little clip here and you can get a better look at it in the camera, I hope. So, See the, the you don't have that 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 spread wing that you want. You this is going to be just on the front. And when you put your floatant on that, it'll help form it even bit more tightly. And on the side, it gives you that nice that nice um, profile that you're looking for uh, to make it look like a mayfly more than anything else. All right. And again, underneath, it's just basic. This has been a real day saver on a, more than one occasion. So a very good little simple pattern to have, very easy to tie. Um, if you use too much hair on it, you know, take a moment, you can actually take your scissors and remove a little bit of the hair on the sides. Just trim it like that until you get the profile you want. Um, with a little bit of practice, you'll get the, the amount of hair you need the effect that you're looking for it doesn't have to be you know really dense it just has to have that profile that we're looking for here okay now ah the big fish catcher i was asked to write an article for the canadian fly fisher magazine many years ago jeez it's been so long now um, the dry fly that catches the most big fish. And without a doubt, the single pattern that catches the most big fish is a spent spinner right at dusk. Um, on the Grand River, it's possible to catch brown trout well into their 20s. 20 inches long, 50 plus centimeters uh, on these little flies. Um, this is not the fly you use after dark, but just as dark as approaching or again, first thing in the morning. And you will, um, you'll be surprised how effective it can be. The fish uh, will key in on last night's spinners drifting down the river. Get there before everybody else in the sun when the sun starts showing. Just use a spent spinner from last night's hatch. Go and shake the, the bushes or look in the look in the spider webs. It'll tell you what the uh, what kind of spinner you're likely to need. Most of these spinners are sort of a mahogany reddish, darkish brown, uh, reddish brown. Um, though you can get some very light ones as well. I'm just going to use the materials that I have here to tie this up. But uh, I would normally use, let's see if I have, I had a package. Oh, there it is. <sighs> That's the problem with not having your glasses on. Do I have anything in here that would be, yeah, that might work. Yeah, we'll tie it with all that. Okay. So the secret to this then is how do I make the wings into spent spinner wings? Um, it's really very simple. Ah, you just did it again, didn't you? All right. Get the, we'll get the tail on first. Uh, what happened to that? There it is. You can use, um, you know, a couple of squirrel fibers from a squirrel tail, or you can use some black bear, or you can use some hackle like I'm doing here. Anything for the tail. The tail is really, in this case, to help float the back end. 
I really don't think it plays a tremendous role in the effectiveness of the fly. And we're going to come up here and put the wing in. So, done. Blue done is a good color for this. Okay. And as before, Bring your thread in front. And it's not as critical to build up the front of this the way we did for the usual. But you do want to get something just to make sure it doesn't lie down too badly. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take the hair I'm going to split it in two. And you're going to take some turns between like that. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take some turns around the base. I usually use three, but you use whatever works for you. I haven't done this one in a while, I can tell. There we go. And there you can see Nice split wing that you get with that. Now, you just dub the body. I'm going to use some, I've got some darkish dry fly dubbing here. Let's see how it looks. You can tie these down very small sizes too, 18s and even 20s. I know you have um, some pretty good spinner falls out there certain times. And I'm sure it's just like the East here where um, the big fish come up and feed on these, these hopless bugs in the surface film. First thing you do is catch a hook point. Very well done, Sheldon. Have we done this before? Gotcha.
And there you have it. Again, very simple, very quick to tie, very durable. It caught me a lot of fish over the years. I've become a very large fan of snowshoe for, well, rabbit in general. I mean, you can make rabbit strips, hare's ear masks. I mean, rabbit is one of the most versatile of all of the tying materials. Yeah. Can you see that well? That at the, at the right time, dead drift presentation right literally right into the fish's mouth you, you got to get pretty accurate with them uh, don't be afraid to cast uh, you've got to uh, typically their their feeding window is only you know not even as wide as your hand is across the back um, and it can be very difficult especially as the light gets low so one of the tricks i've learned is to cast above and beyond the fish a little bit and raise my rod tip until I get the fly into the exact um, feeding lane, right in the little current that they're using, and then lower the rod tip. Ideally, what I want is for the rod to be leveled with the water just where the fish is going to take it. Um, this is especially important if you're using very small flies. If you're tying this in an 18 or a 20, um, and you've got a very light tippet on, when that happens, keep your hand off the fly line and if the fish takes your fly, just lift the rod parallel to the water. Just take the stiffness, the, the, the loose, the, the slack out of the line and let the fish set itself. And then once you know the fish is on, then you can put a bend in the rod and start to fight the fish. More often than not, you'll just pull it free or break it right off if you're, if you're a little too heavy on it. If the wings are a little off, like one side, like longer than the other, just bunch it up and take a thumbnail and trim it a little bit. Don't use scissors, that will come out looking too artificial. And there you have the spinner. Um, even though this is a fairly dark wing, for some reason it shows up really well on the water, all the way across the water. It can be 30, 40 feet away, and you can still see that little bump on the water, especially if the light is sort of coming down from that side. It's been a very effective pattern. Okay. What's next? Oh, the emergers. Right. Again, very simple. I don't like to heavy wire. Seems heavy too. Well, that'll stop well anyway. So, switching hook types. And I think this is a 10. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. This is too big. Bear with me. That's better. That's much better. That must have been a six or an eight or something. There we go. Much better. So this one's a little different. Again. We're going to put
a bit of a different tail on this one. I'm using crystal flash here in root beer, which is one of my favorite colors for shucks and things of that nature. Five or four or five, because it's a big hook. Tie it right down around the bend here. And I'll just trim it that long. So when the, when the fish are trying to deal with the surface film, um, they deal with it in a variety of different ways. The mayflies typically will stick their back in the surface film, their wing case will split open, forcing a hole, and the, and the adult will crawl out through that. Caddis like to um, inflate their bodies with uh, gases and shoot them out their back end and rock propel and punch through. One of the reasons they like to use riffle areas to emerge is that the surface film is broken up a little bit there. It's a little easier for them to get out. Other things, other types of insects like stoneflies just crawl out of the water. You find their shucks all over the place. So different, different approaches to deal with that surface film, which is like a layer of saran to these little tiny insects. We don't even notice it, of course. Um, again, lead pipe, simple stuff, just double body, put on a wing. And that's basically it. The only difference is there are two variations to this, depending on how you like to do it. I do it more like a caddis than anything else, even though it nominally is supposed to imitate a mayfly type insect emerging. So we got, you know, enough of a body on there. Uh, we'll take a tuft of snowshoe. Again, uh, you can take this from the instep if you wish. Doesn't have to be quite as neat as on the usual. Or you can use the heel, especially as the fly gets smaller, because you don't want to tie this back. It's too high. You want the, the wing to be fairly flat over the back. That's a little better. Tie this down. And then I will actually dub a little bit more over it here.
There we go. And this is one you will use when you use your floatant on this. You want to only put the floatant in the wing and maybe a little on the head. And that's it, right up on the top like that. You just want this to sit in the water. So the back end, so it sits in the water kind of this way, with this being the surface level here, like that. Okay? Part of it's hanging down. If you're finding you're having a little trouble getting the rear end to sit down in the water a little bit, I have been known to take some fine copper wire and put a few half a dozen little wraps like just under the back of the just ahead of the tail like and cover it with the with the um the dubbing just to hide it you'll find that will help it to sit down in the water a little bit okay and i've again uh, this this actually saved a weekend for me i caught one fish on the last day in the last hour on one of these so all weekend of fishing, but the water had been high and murky and muddy, and so I'm using that as an excuse. Okay. Now, um, some of you might be familiar with a pattern called the, the shuttlecock. That's a CDC pattern. And Can I ask a question over. before you start, uh, Sheldon? Yes, of course uh you're solely using rabbit foot could you use other parts of the rabbit um well the rabbit of course uh the under fur makes great dubbing i mean that's one thing uh you can use rabbit strips cross cut and 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 um zonker type they're, they're using a lot of patterns and you can use the the face mask and whatnot on hairs and things for things like the hair's ear nymph so what 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 part of the rabbit are you thinking about using? Well, I have a face mask. Yeah. And I have some strips. Yeah. So I was wondering, the strips could you use for the uh, like the spinner wing? Well, if, if the problem with that is is that will soak up so much water so very quickly. Uh, the the beauty of the snowshoe rabbit foot hair, this hard glistening part of it is actually water repellent so it'll help hold the fly in the on the surface okay if yep. you're using just the regular fur parts of the fur it will it'll it'll get soggy and sink very quickly you can put floatant on it but it won't last for very long okay thank you okay um this is one of those patterns where we're actually going to to uh, fold the material a little bit um the shuttlecock named after the, the badminton bird uh, and it looks fairly similar to that um, it's made in a variety of ways but we're going to make it um, an easy way should have taken a couple of these hooks out this time i won't use my fingers so they don't get stabbed so badly there we go So this is a, again, a largely a still water pattern. Um, if you ever get out, I don't know how much lake fishing you really, I know there are lakes in uh, Alberta, but it seems to be a, a very large concentration on <clears throat> river fishing there. Um, in fact, I've never fished a lake in Alberta. I fished a few of the rivers, um, but I'm sure that the process would be the same. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to make this one well i guess i should start with my thread can't do much without starting my thread you'll notice the way i have the hook in the vise it's sitting up a little at a little bit more of an angle i'm going to start about here back about a third of the way. Now you can, if you wish, put a little bit of crystal flash the way we did for the emerger on here. Um, I generally don't. 
you can do that if you wish. We'll dub a little bit of a body forward. Don't want it to be, you're, you're, you're working on a, a large midge or something similar coming off the water. So the body needs to be as thin as you can make it. You want to dub your noodle, you know, sort of double the width of your thread, triple the width of your thread if you can. Spend a little time on it. And I find that as I'm wrapping, when I use my finger, I can help to fit it down nice and evenly by giving it a little push. Tightens it on nicely. And of course, I've got too much. When you start tying these things on a more regular basis, you learn how much dubbing you really need at a time. Okay, I'm gonna put some thread down on here. Again, just to give it some purchase, as the English say. Um, that one's pretty low. I'm looking for long material here. The longer I can get it, the better. And I want to cut it off the bone as close down as I can. So I'm actually pushing down pretty hard. Tie this towards the rear. That's a little too much, I think. Sticking to me. Try that again. Pull this off. Turn it right, get it right back to the body. And then bring your thread right up just to the front of the eye. Now what I like to do is I like to take Some peacock curl. Now, in recent years, I have found diamond dubbed peacock black, and I have switched to doing that from time to time. Take three or four of the strands of peacock. Tie them in. Right up against the wing. Bring your thread forward again. I twist them. I don't know whether it's absolutely necessary, but I do. And form a little bit of a thorax out of them. Like so. Then I pull this forward over the top, tie it down just behind the eye, making a kind of a little bit of a, sh uh, a, sh a wing case on it. Then I take my thread in front a couple of times 
And then I'm going to take a couple of turns of thread around the base. And the idea here is to try and control it so it's sticking up at a good angle like that. And now I'm just going to tie it off. The alternative to this is you tie it back a little further and you can actually tie a, a parachute hackle in here, but then it wouldn't really technically be a shuttlecock. And again, I will take my thumbnail now and I'll take and just even off the top here. So it's the idea is to get a nice, a nice fluffy wing on there. And this will sit in the water like this. The water level will be right about there. And you'll just see this little bump on the surface. And this, it's amazing, you put some floatant in here, which you can't do with the CDC version. And this will, you'd be amazed how well it actually holds up in the water. Um, it will not survive a, um, a riffle. So if you're gonna put it in a riffle, then you'll wanna put um, a bit of a hackle around it in parachute style. If you're gonna do that, you wanna set this back just a little bit on the hook to give you a little more room to work. This has been another one of those gee how come it works kind of thing but it really does You'll, it, it, in still water it's absolutely deadly don't be afraid to tie this in all different kinds of colors even just plain black i've actually just made the body out of the actual thread itself just use black thread and build up a bit of a body on it um, coat it with some some head cement works fine absolutely marvelous uh, pattern. In the end, I might have taken a little too much off of that. You want to have a really nice clump of stuff on the top there. That's what will make it float best. Okay, we're getting through these in record time. Last item. I have some friends of mine who would, who would be very upset with me that I'm showing you this pattern. The Snowshoe IOBO, which stands for It Ought to Be Outlawed. Um, we have a tradition, my friends and I, when we go fishing, we hit a, a stream somewhere, we divide up and go in different directions and meet back for lunch. Um, and inevitably, somewhere along that stream in some bend pool with a log in it is one fish that's been rising and no one was able to catch when that happens we declare something we call uh, nascar rules i have no idea where the name came from i know we stole it from rick car racing it is a bit of a race back to the spot so the first person back gets the first try at the fish they may use any fly they wish they get two or three good casts. If the fish refuses to fly, they're out next person in line until somebody catches the fish. There's no prize or, uh, or um, award for catching the fish. You just get bragging rights until the next time you do that again. Um, and this pattern has been one of those patterns that has worked, uh, gee, almost every dang time. Um, it was shown to me by a, a friend some years ago. It's generally tied quite small. It's also tied in a variety of colors. Here, let me put a couple on a, on a clip here, just so that you can get some idea. These are tiny. There are some 
samples of the IOBO. It is literally a one material fly. Um, there's a couple little tricks to, to tying it. Nothing too fancy. Um, the olive color, this one, believe it or not, is more olive, is the one that seems to have worked the best. But I've caught fish on just about any color that I choose to tie these things up in. Um, crazy. I'm going to have to reduce the hook size a little bit here. I'll try and tie it on a 14. These are probably 18s that you're looking at there. <clears throat> Hopefully you'll be able to see this. This is, again, one of those, it's really not a difficult pattern once you understand how, how it's done. Okay. Start some thread. And now we're going to need Nice long section of hair here. There we go. Okay. I hope this is long enough, we'll see. Okay, so I'm gonna tie it in right at the front here. And I actually want the material to envelop the hook. I'm gonna bring my thread underneath to the back far back as I think I can go. And I'm going to pull the hair down and trap it so that the, the hair has enveloped the hook shank. And then I'm going to just give it a couple of turns of like a rib to come up to the front. I'm going to take my material now and draw it forward like a shell back. I find if you give it a bit of a twist as you're doing it, it sits on there a little better. Tie it down. Go underneath. Yeah, it's a little bit. And as before, I like to take a couple of turns around the base. and tie off. Now, that was hard, difficult, took forever, yes? The idea here is, this is quick and easy, and I'm saying in black, in olive, it has worked Boy. <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed how many times I won the NASCAR rules because of this particular pattern. It's it's that it's that simple. There's nothing to it. Put some head cement. I would normally now have used the thread that closer matches the color that I'm doing, but we're doing this here tonight just so you get a better chance at what's seeing what's going on here. Okay. Any questions? Oh, that's great. Uh, you got about pattern Sheldon look uh, look relatively simple. You know, just a few steps and uh, you're done. And you tied a whole bunch of flies actually in, in an hour and a half tonight. Uh, it's it's impressive. Thank you very much. My my pleasure. Um, the 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 um, you should never confuse 
Never confuse simple fly with an unsophisticated fly. As, as I have been getting older, it takes longer for me to do things now. Um, I have been removing the things that have no impact on a fly pattern, just taking them out. They don't, like wings on dry flies, I just hackle them. I don't bother with the little stand-up points of hair or, or um, hackle tips like on, on, on an Adams and things of like that. That is finicky, takes forever. The damn things never sit up proper unless you tend to spend a lot of time at it. Uh, Wally and his lovely Wally wing, you know, I mean, I, I love to tie those um, wings, but if I'm in a hurry and I got to get on the water and, and, you know, using snowshoe in this ma manner, uh, I can be on the water very quickly and, uh, and they work well. Uh, and, and it's hard to argue about them if they work well. Okay, well, if there's nothing else, uh, I'm done for this evening and I, I hope you enjoyed it all. Thank you.